Hi, so I'm going to give you a quick update on, from the Elixir team on what's been happening in Elixir and what's going to happen in Elixir as well. Uh, so this is the Elixir repo. Uh, we've had 822 contributors since hmm, about 24 hours ago. Uh, so lots of community involvement with the language. In the past and the future, hopefully as well, we'll get lots of third-party contributors, just not from the Elixir team itself. So thank you, everyone, who's contributed already. Uh, Elixir gets a release every six months. We have semantic versioning, so there should be as much backwards compatibility as possible. Um, of course, bug fixes at the language level can be feature changes for some people, private APIs that you're not supposed to call, they can change. But apart from that, um, it should be backwards compatible. Um, and every six months there's a new release. Ah. So Elixir 1.7. Um, this was mainly integrating with OTP changes, so logger, as a new logger in um, OTP, the new way of handling stack traces, handle continuing gen server, nicer warnings, nicer errors. Elixir is always trying to improve warnings, improve errors, give a nice user experience so you can actually understand completely what went wrong with your application. Uh, so new stack traces. OTP changed how stack traces are fetched, so we had to catch up with them. Um, the reason for this change is that it's cheaper to only know about the stack trace uh, inside the scope of a rescue, so you don't have to keep arguments around forever that could essentially be a memory leak. Um, so going forwards, this is how you should fetch stack traces in Elixir. Underscore, underscore, stack trace, underscore, underscore, and it's only available inside the scope of a rescue or a catch. Um, OTP21 introduced a new, more efficient logger. Elixir integrates with it. Um, previously, it Erlang logging, error logger was via a gen event process. Now a lot of the logging is handled in the calling process to reduce the bottleneck, and you can choose exactly how you want to log. Um, handle continue. This was actually contributed by Jose. Um, there's a new callback, optional callback for gen server. It allows you to send uh, a, a term to a callback without receiving a message. This callback handle continue is called immediately. Um, this allows you to move to a new state so that if an exception is raised, the error logs will include this new state. Um, one use case is to prevent yourself sending a message. There could be messages that arrive in between your current callback and the next one. Um, also, uh, documentation was improved. You can now add metadata to documentation. Um, this was part of a proposal sent to Erlang, the EEP48, and EEP is how you propose a change to Erlang. Uh, people can discuss it, um, and yeah, you can attach documentation strings and metadata to a beam file and then fetch it in the shell. Um, this is what an EP looks like. Uh, you can see at the top it says author Jose, except that's not Unicode, so we also call up with Unicode 11. <laughs> this is my favorite emoji added in Unicode 11, it's a hippo. Um, yeah, we've got some nicer warnings as well. Uh, this warning I've showed on the screen is when you compare a literal struct um, and expect it to be ordered. Because structs use maps, there's no guarantee of the order. So if you, for example, try to sort a date time, uh, you may expect that to be an order of the date. That will not be the case. So do not do that. And this warning should appear. Um, also, we've got nice errors in uh, XUnit. So if you have an assertion, and you have variables passed to a function call, we will show what those variables are in the assertion error. Okay, Elixir 1.8. So this was six months later. We added, um, you know, Elixir's not moving uh, super quickly at the moment, you know, it's very stable. Um, so we added a way to ins a default uh, inspect protocol uh, so that you can not have to implement inspect for every single protocol that you, every single uh, struct that you create. We added time zone database support, faster compile times, and a thing called callers that I'll talk about shortly. Um, so what is the ins derive inspect protocol? Uh, it allows you to automatically list the keys you want to include. If anyone has worked on GDPR, you might be very familiar with what you need to do here. Um, you'll see that at the bottom, this is what it looks like when you inspect and include only. It skips those extra keys that you don't want to show. Um, so in 1.3, Elixir finally, you might say, added support for date, time, and time structs 
Before that, we decided time was too difficult and to handle. Um, and even now, when we have these structs, we decided that handling a time zone database was too difficult, that we weren't going to do it ourselves. And we were going to provide a behavior and let other people fail to do it. Um, and this is Lau, who has been a great asset to uh, the Elixir community on helping people with calendars, date time, etc. He is um, he has TZ Data, which is a time zone um, database, which allows you to keep up with time zone changes. It can automatically fetch up to new versions of the time zone database. This is changing all the time. This is like it's a great job by Lau anyway, because um, if you want time zone data, this is um, a way to do conversions. Otherwise, you're just stuck with UC UTC time. Um, OK, callers. What is a caller? So um, in OTP, uh, there's a module called proc, proclib. And that uh, has some extra information. And it's the base module for working with OTP processes. It has a thing called ancestors. An ancestor is all the processes above that process. So every supervisor above your gen server. The first ancestor will be that gen server supervisor, and then that supervisor supervisor up until the application level. Um, so Elixir has uh, tasks, which allows you to spawn a new process. These can be spawned underneath a supervisor. So a task's ancestor will be the supervision tree, not the process that called it. Um, you also want to have information about this starting or calling process so that you can instrument knowing who is looking to receive this task, which process actually started this task. Um, a kind of equivalent would be the process that calls supervisor start child. Um, one use case we had for this was the Ecto, Ecto SQL sandbox, where we um, isolate different tests inside a transaction. And if you start a task, you want that task to use the same sandbox. And with this feature, we can now do it automatically. Previously, you had to pass some options around. And sometimes you would forget. And the sandbox may not do what you thought it would do. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. The caller is the process that sends the message to the supervisor saying, start this task. The task will then get um, the caller in its process dictionary. Um, it will be displayed in er any error messages. If you have a task start another task, you will have all the chains of callers. So that even um, in the Ecto sandbox case, if you have a task starting a task starting a task starting a task, they will all use the same sandbox. OK. Elixir 1.9. Um, this will be coming out in July, hopefully. Um, one improvement was made was uh, more efficient overload handling in the logger and release build-in support and whatever the OTP team do in OTP 22, we will hopefully integrate with them, and everything will work great together. Um, so logger overload handling. Previously, overload handling was calculated inside the logger process. This could mean if your logger was slow, suddenly you would have a really big message queue, and you could even potentially run out of memory even with the overload handling. Now we've moved the overload handling outside the process to the process that's making the logging call. This is much safer, and it's also faster. If you're using OTP 21 Plus, it uses the new efficient mutable calendars module, um, which hopefully you'll hear about later on in this conference if you don't know what it is. Uh, and releases. OK, so Elixir said that the best way to deploy is with a release, and yet it did not support releases. Oh, it didn't have built-in support for releases. Thankfully, Paul's provided community support for a long time, and he's done a great work on providing release support. Um, he actually made three attempts, XRM1, Dithery1, Dithery2, and these have all been great iterations. Um, the Elixir support is much simpler than what Paul um, provided. It's like the, what the, almost like the minimum you need for release support and we've also made a few changes to make it integrate nicer with nerves. But most of the nicer integration is actually because um, it's simpler. Um, these are the features we have in releases. Um, hopefully, some of these you, you want to use or need to use. Um, hopefully, there's not too much missing. Um, 
The main thing, the way that a release is built in Elixir is you have a pipeline. It has uh, immutable configuration, and this goes through the different stages of this pipeline. You can add your own stages uh, in this pipeline so you can make changes to the release artifact before it um, is finished. We include uh, the Earth's runtime or not. You can uh, use your own boot script. A boot script is how the VM starts up. Uh, you can use mixed config for static config, so when you build the release, your mixed config that you're used to with your mixed project is a static configuration. Uh, you can have any number of releases with any number of subsets of the applications in an umbrella project. Uh, you can change how the release starts uh, with a custom bash script, um, which I'll show you later. It's got remote console. It also includes Elixir and IEX itself, so you can start those um, inside your release if you want to, not just the release. And we also have first class window support. Believe it or not, Elixir actually has first class window support for everything. But it's just you know, worth mentioning for those who are on Windows. Because you know, people forget that maybe it's, maybe it's not there. So mix help release. Um, this, it's a mixed task to build a release. Uh, you can give the release a name and in your mix EXS project file, you can say what this name should target. Uh, this is what happens when you run mix release. Uh, you, it creates uh, the release, it builds everything, and then this shows you a little bit of help about like how you start the release, how you get a remote console, how you might stop the release. Uh, this is the directory structure. Hopefully this is kind of familiar. Uh, the bin is where these bash scripts are. Uh, you see those bat files, that's the window support. Um, the Erlang runtime, and then you can see the libraries that have been included, and then the release directory as well and the cookie for distributed um, Erlang. Uh, these are the commands that your, the default um, uh, bash script that starts your release can do. So you can start your system, you can do it with IEX, so it's like having a console version, you can start it in the background, you can evaluate commands against the running release, you can restart release, you can stop it, and you can get the version. Um, also you can customize how you start a release, so if you go into the start bash script, you can put whatever you want there, or you can just leave it as the default. Okay, um, and that's basically a quick rundown of releases. Um, there's lots and lots of documentation. If you do mix help release, there is so much documentation that I cut off like pages of it. So um, there'll be some more iteration as well before the release. Um, what we didn't include, so for a long time, Elixir said it was gonna include an HTTP client. The reason we thought we were going to include an HP client was because we wanted to be able to have native support for fixing hex packages. So this is like a requirement of the language. And we also, there was some thinking that maybe OTP might change what HP client they have, but that didn't happen. So we didn't include it because we don't actually need it in the language. Um, but what it would have been is Mint, and that got released a couple of days ago. So if you're interested in a very low level HP client without any processes, it's just a thin wrap around the socket and state. Um, I recommend checking it out. Uh, okay, for the future, Elixir 1.10 plus. Stability, hopefully. Maybe we can just all go on holiday. Um, no, but seriously, uh, in the future, you know, Elixir is doing really well, Erlang is doing really well. Um, the Elixir language now is probably like as complex as it's gonna get. There is very little low hanging fruit to work on Elixir. Um, it should hopefully be very stable if you want to make improvements to Elixir, so there's great places like faster compilation, better error messages. These kind of things maybe rely on you contributing to OTP instead of Elixir. If you want to change how the beam works to benefit Elixir, performance improvements, again, you have to contribute to Erlang rather than Elixir because Elixir loves Erlang and we rely on it heavily. Um, also, contributing to the community and the ecosystem in general. Okay. Thanks. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, is there going to be any effort to get uh, callers to work for things besides tasks? Probably not. What, <laughs> what, what, what would you want it to work for? Like a gen server call or? Um, like for example, gen stage might be a thing where you have essentially things in a pipeline. You could have many, many callers, so it could be quite difficult. 
Yeah. Um, in Gen Stage, though, when you receive a message, you do see who it's from. So in your Gen Stage um, ha handle events, you can get the, the caller there, like you can in a Gen Server handle call as well. So hopefully you don't need it. Uh, hi, I have a quick question. Uh, I've been playing around with Elixir for a little bit, and one of the interesting things is that when it comes to basically using JSON, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like, I don't know, every six months, someone wants to basically create another JSON library. <laughs> so when I go to basically use a library, it's like, okay, I need JSON, I go to like hex PM, and then basically I have like many different choices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I, I guess my question is, is it any plans to create like something like uh, an abstraction layer for maybe like, uh, you know, like say like JSON, which basically uses some, I guess you can say a reasonable default, right? Uh, there's many different versions. I just want to basically use one. <laughs> uh, well, it's kind of going back to what we didn't include, right? We don't need JSON for the, for the language. And as you say, if the best practice changes every six months, we as a language can't keep up with that. It's possible um, Erlang will add JSON support. I saw there's a PR open with a BIF for JSON. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Hi, uh, is there going to be like a, a way to expand or to, do, to debug macros? To do what, sorry? To debug or expand macros? Because uh, uh, sometimes <laughs> it's really hard like to, to dig into those. Uh, Jose? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is, it is possible today, we have functionality to, to debug and expand macros, but uh, you would have to do it yourself, right? Like, so you would have to like go and say, oh, I want to call this macro if those arguments, so I wanted to expand it. I think if you want, so the tool is there in the language. If you want to improve it, I would say it's more of a matter of like working with editors. So maybe go to your favorite editor. You probably have something that, has Alex that is improving your Elixir experience with your editor and see if that's a feature that makes sense. I know that some editors some time ago did have this feature where you could say, you would go to some place in your code and you would say expand this and it would expand everything and show everything expanded. Um, so it is possible it's there. I think it's mostly a question of how can we improve <coughs> the tooling so the developer experience around it is really good. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, James.